Hey, good morning. I hope you are doing well. Uh, kind of a special day for us that you may not be aware of as a church. It's special because of just honoring uh, the growing place and uh, getting to see some of that ministry and what we do there. But today is also the closest thing to the 10th year anniversary in which we started our, had our first live service. So that was September 19th, and today's the 10 year. <clears throat> Yeah, and you're kind of, those of us that have kind of been around for a while here, we understand amazing what God has done in our services and in our, in our church, and very, very thankful. And so uh, we've all been brainstorming about, well, how do we celebrate 10 years? And so we're going to do cakes and cupcakes, but we're going to kind of celebrate for a while, we figured. And, uh, but today, uh, we, we're going to do something that's kind of unique that I wanted to share with you. And in my hand are these 10 envelopes. And no, they're not for you, so they're just, everybody relax. Um, but what they are for, who they are for, is we have selected, in honor of the 10-year anniversary, our church has selected 10 churches, local churches. And we are sending them a check for $1,000 each to help reach the 96000 and so we put a letter together. Yeah, that's kind of a cool thing to celebrate, isn't it? <clears throat> so these will go out this week, and I just thought you'd be incredibly proud that you decided to be a part of this. And um, what a great thing for us to invest in local churches and say, and we're not asking for anything. We're just saying, hey, you're in the same county we are. We've seen some, some things about your church that are really kind of exciting, and we want to be a part of it. And so um, use this however you see fit to help reach the 96,000, which is a really, really cool thing to do. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you've done in this congregation, in this church, and in this community. Thank you, Lord, for those who could actually date their time for when they came and joined and are now part of this church. Um, it's very evident to all of us, Lord. When we look at the last 10 years, it's very evident that you have been moving in our community and in our church. And Lord, as we pause at this anniversary, we just want to say that um, we're still in. And as you lead us, we're going to follow. And we're here because of obedience to what you've called us to do, who you've called us to be. And Lord, as we think about the next period of time, and it's, it's all for you, Lord. So whatever, whatever you have planned, um, this church, we, we want you to see us and, and know that we're in. And so thank you for what you've done in this place. Thank you for the lives that are changed. Thank you for the community that has helped. Thank you for the incredible community relationships that we are forming. And uh, all praise, all honor, all glory go to you in your name. Amen. <clears throat> well, um, I read an article this past week, and uh, the article featured or what they proclaimed, the headline read, this is the world's first selfie. And because I know someone who's doing a series on selfie, I decided I should go look at that. And this is actually the selfie, if we have a picture maybe on the screen, I don't know. There, yeah, this is the selfie right there, uh, the guy that's on your right. Uh, this, is a, this is a selfie. His name is Oscar Gustav Redslander, and I'm very certain I'm saying that correctly. And um, he's a pioneering Swedish Victorian art photographer, and this picture was actually discovered in a book that was being auctioned off, and this picture kind of came out. Guess what? This acclaimed first selfie, it sold for $113,463. So I've been telling my kids, shoot away. <laughs> Take as many selfies as you want. You never know. You never know. Let me ask you this question. How many of you would pay close to $115,000 for that picture? Well, you know, there's not too many of us in the room that would. You know, one or two, I see you, uh, that would be willing to do that. And the reason I bring all this to your attention is I want to share with you an economic principle from the business world. And I want you to hold on to this because I want to drop it on us and then we're going to visit back toward the end of the service. Here's the economic principle from the world of business. The value of a thing is the price it will bring. Hear me on this. The value of a thing is the price it will bring. Value is not what it costs to create something in business world. The value of a thing is the price it will bring. The value is what someone is willing to pay for it. And someone was willing to pay $115,000 for Mr. Oscar's picture. Now, I want you to hold on to that principle. The value of a thing is the price it will bring. And we're going to come back and visit it at the end of our time together. Have you ever noticed how nobody ever hopes for his or child to be average? <laughs> I know we kind of talked about this a little bit when we discussed Samson, but just thought I'd revisit it for a moment. Nobody sets out in a brand new marriage and says, hey, I hope that our love will last forever and be as average as it possibly can. That would be a wonderful thing for us. Nobody looks at their kids and says, man, 
how wonderful it is to have average kids. This is the most average toddler I've ever seen, you know. Nobody says that about their kids. Hey, take a picture. Look at Look how average they are. Nobody says that. Nobody, nobody wants an average dog, right? It's weird. You kind of have below average and above average. And so, but anyway, we, nobody wants an average dog. Nobody wants to marry an average spouse. And they'll go, well, she's kind of average. I'll go ahead and hook up with her. That'd be wonderful. Nobody wants that kind of mentality. So, so here's the question. What kind of person do you think you want to be? What kind of person do you want to be? You see, I just putting all the cards on the table, I I want to be extraordinary. (laughs) And I don't mean that as pride as much as appreciating the life that I've been given. For however long I get to breathe, I want to be an extraordinary dad. I want to be an extraordinary husband. I want to be an extraordinary friend and an extraordinary pastor. And I want to be an extraordinary employer and a a great leader. And I want to be an extraordinary golfer, but that's never going to happen. So I get to play with extraordinary golfers that are really good. Now, now, believe me, uh, you, you think I'm living with my head in the clouds here. Just let me assure you that I'm fully aware that bad things happen to us. They happen to all of us. Everybody understands that. And certainly they happen in, in, in your pastor's life too, but I have little control over what happens to me, but I do have control over how I respond to what happens to me. Does that make sense? And I want to do so in an extraordinary fashion. I want to resp- the things that happen that I don't, I want to, I want to respond with extraordinary. Now, before you kind of blow me off, it's just kind of positive kind of message sort of thing. It, it's not that. Imagine if someone walked up to you or someone you work with or someone you're living with and you're someone in your family or something, and they're listening to this message. And they say, I want to be extraordinary now. <laughs> I want to be extraordinary at work. I want to be extraordinary at home. I want to be extraordinary wherever, at school. I want to be extraordinary daughter. I want to be an extraordinary spouse, extraordinary son. I'm going to be an extraordinary grandparent. Imagine that. How are you going to respond to their desire to be extraordinary? Are you going to say, well, don't be getting all extraordinary on me. Let's try to shoot for average. You just try to be average, okay, spouse? You just try to be average, okay, kids? Don't try to be extraordinary. That'd be stupid. Nobody's going to say that, correct? We're all thinking that, you know, this would look so good. So what if we decided as a, as a group to be extraordinary people? What if we decided not, <clears throat> not settling for average, not nominal, but I'm talking about extraordinary. And I'm not talking about being extraordinary at something. I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm speaking of being extraordinary, an extraordinary person. Because I believe that not only can we do that, but I believe this is what God is calling people to. I would suggest that if you claim to be a Christian, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and I'm not sure how many of you claim to do that, but if if that's your, your claim, then you have to live an extraordinary life. You don't have options. In fact, if you're living an average, you're kind of slacking. And you say, why do you say that? Well, a couple things. One, you believe in a personal God who's intimately involved in your life. How can you offer that average? You believe that God sent his son to pay for your sins, which was a personal gift. So you've received an extraordinary gift. How can we be average? Number three, you believe that time is linear and all of creation is actually moving someplace and your story is part of the story. How, do you, how can you possibly want to write a chapter that's average with your story? And lastly, you believe you are made in the image of God and every single day matters. And so if you're made in the image of God, how can we say it's so great to be average unless your God is average? but you don't believe that. Now, I've been toying with you a little bit because the tension that you may be feeling is the tension that I just created in this room. You agree that we're to live extraordinary lives, but the reality is most of us don't feel too extraordinary. Guess what? (laughs) That tension between the desire to live extraordinary and having very real kids who are sick the desire to live extraordinary and having a marriage that is struggling, the desire to live extraordinary and have finances that aren't really extraordinary, that tension is exactly what you have in common with the last judge we're going to talk about in this series. 
We've been studying this book of Judges in the Old Testament, so hold on to it for a moment. And you may know that Moses leads his people out of Egypt, and then uh, along the way comes Joshua, and Joshua leads the people into the promised land. And then once they're in the promised land, um, they're deciding how are we going to be governed. And so they govern themselves by judges. And the basic idea here is that Israel's supposed to be a theocracy. Theocracy means that it's governed by God, and the judges were basically to interpret what God's law says. And so we have all these judges that are there for this 300-year period of time that were waiting between Joseph, or I'm sorry, Joshua, and between King Saul, 300-year period of time. But the judges are this miserable failure. In fact, the people of God during this time follow a cycle, and the cycle basically goes like this. The people of God disobey God's law, which is a big deal in a theocracy. We're based on God. The first thing we're going to do is disobey God's law. And then after they've disobeyed God's law, disaster happens because it always happens when people disobey God's law. (laughs) And then this disaster gets so bad, the people of God are sorry for disobeying God's law, and they ask God to deliver, and God delivers. Well, then they start the cycle over and over again. That's the whole cycle in the book of Judges. And there's this verse we've been using in throughout this series from Judges chapter 21. It's actually repeated throughout the last half of the book, and this is what it said. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. And we've kind of latched on to that verse and kind of made it our, the, the selfie worldview, kind of the champion, championing the cause of selfie worldview. I should be free to do what I want to do, when I want, with whom I want, as long as I'm not hurting anybody. And that's kind of how people are seeing the world these days. It's how people are interpreting things. In fact, throughout this series, I know many of you have started interpreting news stories. Well, that's the selfie worldview. You've seen it. And this selfie worldview resulted in that crazy cycle. This disobedience and disaster and then praying for deliverance. And I have one more judge to talk with you about this whole thing. And this is one of my favorite judges. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to introduce you to the judge. You need to go home and read these stories for yourself because they are one of some, kind of a bright spot in the whole judge discussion. The judge I want to talk to you about today is a guy named Gideon. Gideon believed in God, but, he did with, he, but with the circumstances of his life, they were all making him feel very average. He believed in this awesome God of his ancestors and his grandparents and such, but he didn't feel that way. He felt ordinary. He even felt sort of weak. So here's what we have. We have a judge who believes that God is awesome and wonderful and praiseworthy, but their life, they felt sort of average. Sound familiar? And that's exactly where this judge was. Gideon and his people are under oppression. I'm going to talk to you about it in a minute. And everybody sees doom and gloom. And Gideon believes about himself the same thing that everybody else believes about him or herself. There's nothing exceptional here. We're all just average. And what's so interesting about Gideon's story is God shows up and essentially says to Gideon, what in the world are you doing being average? Why are you being average? Average, nominal, ordinary, what are you doing there? Wake up and start living. So let's start the story. Judges chapter 6. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, disobey. And for seven years, he gave them into the hands of the Midianites, okay? That's disaster. Because the power of the Midians was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Now, Let's just put it, make it real here. The mighty people of God, the ones that you've heard all the stories when you were a little kid, the ones you heard in Sunday school, the ones you've heard proclaimed from this platform where God does this amazing stuff, those people are hiding in caves and they are afraid. And then what would happen is they would kind of sit there and they would wait for them to strike. And the people have like the Red Sea and manna and the pillars of cloud and pillars of fire, all that back there, the water that gushes out of a rock. The people that have all that through their rear windshield, they're living in rocks and caves. And the Midianites would ravage the land and kill the livestock and ruin the crops. And this went on for seven years. And finally, the people that are stuck in the cycle disobey disaster and deliverance, they say, Midian so impoverished, verse 6, the Israelites, that they cried out to the Lord for help. Lord, deliver us. 
And once again, God is merciful to people who do not deserve mercy. And of course, this is good news for me and it's good news for you. And he never grows weary of pouring out his love. And so God sends his messenger to a man named Gideon, verse 11. Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Now let's just pause here for a moment. Because I don't understand anything in that sentence. Um, let me kind of tell you a little bit what's happening. Uh, threshing wheat, in my expert knowledge and experience, uh, has something to do with throwing up this uh, stems of stalks of wheat and all this stuff up in the air, and basically they would let the wind blow all the stuff out of the wheat that didn't belong there. You with me? And so that's kind of the basic plan. The problem we have, and the mighty hero of the morning is, Gideon's actually doing this in a wine press. Now, my only experience with wine press is very, not experience, I just read about this, uh, large women stomping on grapes, you know, kind of thing. I don't know if that's where he's at, but it's some building inside. It's like a small little barn or a basement cellar, some have suggested, or at least, the very least, it's at least a valley. The point is, he's hiding, and things are so bad, he's trying to throw the wheat up, and he's going, (laughs) trying to get some wind, I'm just guessing, to kind of get the whole stuff out of there that needs to get out of it. That's what's happening. This is the mighty... Mighty Gideon. But Gideon's afraid for his life. He is afraid, he's vulnerable, he's paranoid. Gideon Gideon feels very fragile. And so he's threshing wheat in hiding in a small house, barn, whatever. Verse 12. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. To which Gideon did this. Because he's hiding, threshing wheat in a wine press. Now, something, just a little grammar geek stuff for you here. But do you see the word you in that verse? You know, it says, the angel of the Lord appeared to you and said, the Lord is with you. It's singular here. It's singular. In other words, the messenger is speaking directly to Gideon. This isn't about like, some general statement like on Sunday, Lord, we praise you. No, no, it's not that at all. The angel is saying, the Lord's with you personally Gideon and of course you have to notice the mighty warrior description (laughs) now what's so cool about the story of Gideon is in the other stories if we talked about the other judges and all that God raised up an individual but in Gideon God is going to actually show us how he raised up a judge and even though Gideon is anything but a mighty warrior The blessing we have is we get to see how God is going to change him into one, from nominal, from average, to extraordinary. This is a big deal for us. Today, he's hiding and he's vulnerable, he's scared, he's even cowardly. Anything but what he would truly desire for his life, but God has a plan. Verse verse 13, but sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, hold on to that, Why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not God bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord's actually abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. And this is an exceptional verse. And it is so telling for those of us that have been involved in this selfie series, so relevant to our lives. Because when God spoke to Gideon, watch this, he used the singular pronoun, you. <clears throat> but when Gideon responds to the message of the Lord, he uses the plural pronoun. Now watch this, because this is so me, and it is so you. If the Lord is with us, Gideon says. In other words, Gideon sees himself just like everybody else. And he forgets all those things that I mentioned to you about why we should have extraordinary lives. Gideon sees himself just like everybody else. There are no extraordinary people in a wine press, just us cowards that are hiding in a wine press in caves and rocks. We're not extraordinary. We're actually forgotten by God. I am just like everybody else. And you know what? I think that's where some of us are today. (laughs) We're sort of hiding. We're We're surviving, we feel weak and we feel afraid and we've forgotten the faith of our childhood because we've become so wise and world smart now. (laughs) 
And we've pushed to the back of our minds the last night of youth camp we had growing up or the time when we gave it all to Jesus or a time when we surrendered and God met us. And we've conveniently forgotten that answered prayers over the years because we haven't had our prayers answered lately. And so we find ourselves living in a cowardly kind of way. As if God has lost track of us on the great planet. And Gideon asks a fair question, one I think everybody in the room has to ask, and that's this. If you are for us, God, then why in the world are people suffering? And I hope you'll find some comfort in knowing, at least (laughs) I've asked the question and I continue to ask the question, but I wasn't the first. It was asked at least 3,000 years ago. And you know what's really cool? God wasn't offended by the question. God knows the human condition. He knows the world we're in better than we do. God knows disease and disappointment and he knows sin and he knows fear and he knows evil and suffering. And He knows your condition better than you do because he made you. Verse 14, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? He's in a wine press, threshing wheat because he's afraid. And the Lord like, doesn't even address it. Just, just get on out there and put your head on the chopping block. It's going to be fine. Just go ahead. And that's essentially what Gideon says. But Lord, how can I save Israel? My clan's the weakest. <clears throat> weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. I'm not even ordinary. I'm like below nominal. I'm, I'm way down on the pole. Lord, I am just like everybody else. My whole clan's weak. Our whole city's weak. Our whole population's weak. I'm nobody. I'm not perfect, and I'm certainly not heroic. I'm just me, just ordinary, trying to pay the bills and surviving the day. I don't have any gifts. I'm not wealthy. I'm not in a position of influence. I'm not even sure I have my health. I'm not strong. I'm not emotionally whole. I'm the least And I come from the least people. I'm in nowhere USA. Verse 16, God says, Oh, my mistake. I must be at the wrong place. Google Maps has messed me up once again. If you're wondering, that's not in there. But I thought it before. Lord, do you know who you're asking to do this? Come on, haven't you? Lord, are you fully aware of my history? (laughs) Lord, are you fully aware of my lack of ability? Lord, are you fully aware of my emotional dysfunctions? I do think you might be at the wrong house. You probably meant to get my brother. Or you probably meant to get that person over there. Look at them, they're doing really well. You probably meant those people over there. You're in the wrong place today. This is Tom's house. You need to be at someone else's house. But that's not what happens in this story. Because what comes next is vitally important to everybody in this room. What comes next has been my prayer this week for each and every one of us as we talk about, as we think about what we're supposed to take away this morning. My prayer is that if God would be so kind as to turn a light on in in my soul and the souls of those who come to alive today, that that we could grasp this, that, that if we could, everything would change. Listen, I mean this sincerely. Everything would change in your life and my life if we could grasp what happens in this story. And up until this point, how Gideon feels about his situation is based solely on what everybody else feels in that situation. And we do this. I do this. We, we view our circumstances by how everybody else views their circumstances. Oh, we don't have enough money to pay the bills. We don't either. Let's get another job. Oh, we don't have enough situation to get my health. I know, we got bad health too. But God views Gideon differently, and God views Gideon as a mighty warrior. What if God views you and your circumstances differently? 
What if God views you, dare I say it, as a mighty warrior? What if that's how God views you? And instead of how God may be viewing you, you are spending your entire life with how you view you or how everybody else views you. And all the while, God's saying, hey, dude, you might be a mighty warrior if you stopped acting like a pansy. I don't know if God speaks to you like that. He does to me, okay? I'm just saying. What if God views us differently? What if God does not see you or your circumstances like everybody else does? And so my prayer in recent days has been, God, help me to see myself the way you see me. And that's been my prayer for you this week. God, help us to see ourselves. Help me to see these circumstances the way you see them. Because Gideon had no idea that God could be aware of his threshing wheat in the wine press. Just like, respectfully, you often have no idea that God is aware of your battle and your struggle, your loneliness, your situation. Because we don't have wine presses, but we have very dark rooms. See, we have this personal Savior in Jesus Christ, and He is my Lord and Savior. And I've been praying all this this week because of this verse in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians. Now we see but this poor reflection, as in a mirror. But then we shall see face to face. Now, I just know in part, in my circumstances, in my personal wine press, I just know in part, but then I'm going to know fully, even as I am fully known. And I wonder how many of us today are seeing a poor reflection in a mirror. But what is ahead for you is God's revelation an unadulterated perspective of God activity in and for and through your life. And all the while, we're sitting here just seeing such a poor reflection because we're interpreting things like everybody else because, ashamedly, we've bought into the selfie worldview more than we want to acknowledge. Gideon says, how can I be extraordinary? I am the least how can I survive or overcome these circumstances? I'm in hiding in a wine press, and you have the audacity to call me a mighty warrior. Now lean in real close alive here. Because here comes the moneymaker. Here comes the change agent. Here comes the aha moment in Gideon's story. Here comes the key that unlocks a person who feels like everybody else and raises them up to a mighty warrior. So lean in close, Judges 6, verse 16. How can you possibly use me? And the Lord answered, I will be with you. Well, that kind of changes things, God. And it's in this moment that Gideon has a decision to make. And friends, respectfully, it's the decision that many of us in this room have to make as well. (laughs) Because really, a lot of us in the room have never actually made this decision. Because many of us know that God is with us. The decision we have to make is whether or not we are going to be with God. Many of us in the room know that God's with us at church. What we wonder is if, if God will actually be with us and we can be with him in the hospital room. Many of us know that God is with us when we're here at Alive, but we wonder if God's with us when we're trying to refinance the house. Many of us know that God is with us up here when Tom is speaking on a Sunday morning, but is it possible that God could be with me when I'm speaking to my kids on Monday? And the decision that we have to make if we can buy into the fact that God is with us because it's plastered throughout Scripture, the decision we have to make is, are you going to live the with God life? Or do you want to keep threshing wheat in the wine press? And this is the defining moment for Gideon. I will live as one who is confident that God is with me. And it's the question that you have to answer. Do you want to stop? Do you want to be extraordinary? Well, then stop living like everybody else and live like you are actually with God and God is with you. Again, from Romans, New Testament world. 
What should we say in response to this, Paul writes? Well, if God's for us, I'd like to add this, who in the right mind dares to be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, his son, graciously give us all things? I wonder what you think about all that. Do you remember the economic principle I taught you at the beginning of the message? The value of a thing is the price it will bring. Oh Lord, could you please, in this moment, by the power of your Holy Spirit, allow us to grasp this truth at the soul level. You see, you are so valuable to God that he equated you with the price of his son and the value of a thing is the price it will bring. So apparently you and not just you, but apparently all the people you drove by on your way here today, apparently there's enough value in you, in your own little wine press, in your own physical condition, in your own sickness, your own successes, your own stresses, your own failures, your own weaknesses, the things you're good at, the things you're not good at, your own embarrassing moments, your own regrets, your own shame. Apparently you, singular, you, equated in God's mind to the price of his own son. So here's my question. What if we live to that value? You may think you're hiding in a wine press these days or suffering in a sick bed or fighting the aloneness of emotional wounding or feeling the rejection of a loved one or a group of friends. You may think you are the only one or you may think you are just like everybody else, but please allow me to boldly share with you the reality of your particular situation because according to what I read in God's Word, and I believe the Bible is God's Word, and according to that, the maker of the world seems to think about you, that you have incredible value, so much value, that he was willing, even though it was so painful, even as I think about telling you this story, I get choked up thinking about if that was me having to give up my son for you people. Is that fair? Can I, can I at least go there for a minute? And that chokes me up to even talk that way, right? To even think that way but I'm made in the image of God. And so if it chokes me up, I know it chokes him up. In fact, I wonder if he even still gets choked up when he hears us talk about it. The maker of the world thinks you have so much value that he was willing, even though it was caused him great pain, to give his son on your behalf. The value of a thing that you <laughs> is the price it will bring that's the son of God do you understand you have an opportunity to live the with God life and he's made himself available and pledged his presence to be with you now you have to decide if you are going to be with him And this was so important that you and I understood this and that you and I remembered this. It's one of the few things that God actually asked us to continue to do after Jesus left. He said, when you folks worship, when you come together, <clears throat> I want you to do this 
And I want you to do it, why? In remembrance of me. Now why is that so important? Because you have to be reminded of how valuable you are to him. And he says, so on this Sunday at Alive Wesleyan, when you prepare to take communion and the body's going to be broken, I want you to remember that my body was broken because the value of a thing is the price it will bring. And when you eat the bread, don't just eat the bread, but eat understanding your value to the maker of the universe. And do it in remembrance of me. And then he grabbed a cup on the table because up to that point, everybody was thinking, well, maybe his body's going to be messed up a little bit. But then he sunk the reality even deeper. And I pray you'll allow the reality to sink even deeper. And he grabbed the wine that was on the middle of the table and he said, this is my blood that was poured out for you. Why in the world would you pour your blood out for me? Because the value of a thing is the price it will bring. And whenever you drink this, I want you to do so in remembrance of me. I gave all because of how much I value you. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And it's exactly what, exactly what we're going to celebrate here in this moment. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to just allow you to be seated and we're going to pass baskets to you. And in the basket will be a piece of bread and a grape. And you can take and partake of communion however and whenever you want to. Heavenly Father, I pray now that your spirit would affirm this truth in the hearts of these folks. How blessed I feel, how honored I feel, how humbled I feel to stand before this group of people with the very symbols of my value here at my feet. And I have to tell you, Lord, I wrestle with that. It's, it's a love I can't even comprehend. I feel like things are going to blow up inside of me because I don't know that I've ever, I don't know how to interpret someone giving life for me. So Holy Spirit, I need you to guide me through this. We need you to guide us through this today. And as we partake the bread and the grape today, Oh, Lord, sting into our minds and our soul. Oh, Tom, the value of a thing is the price it will bring. Do you see your value? Live with me. Live the with me life. And I pray you would whisper that message across this whole auditorium today, across this whole hill and campus this morning, so that we will live the with God extraordinary life. Bless these elements, allow them to be a means of grace for us, I pray in this moment. In your name, amen.